Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. My name is Jeremy Begbie. I'm director of Duke Initiatives in Theology and the Arts. And together with the Presbyterian Reformed House of Studies, we are, who are co-sponsoring this event, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all here to Goodson Chapel for this distinguished lecture. And a special welcome to those who've come from outside the Divinity School. Indeed, some have come some distance for this. There will be many here for whom James K.A. Smith needs no introduction. Nevertheless, Dr. Smith is Professor of Philosophy at Calvin University, Grand Rapids in Michigan. Trained in various institutions, including Villanova University, where he earned his PhD, his energy and huge range of interests give testimony to his having one of the liveliest and penetrating Christian minds of our time. He's especially adept at building bridges between the academy, society, and the church. His publications, of course, are numerous, including Desiring the Kingdom, Imagining the Kingdom, and Awaiting the King. Many here will have been enriched by what has become a best-selling classic, You Are What You Love. What we're going to hear this afternoon is, in fact, a taste of a forthcoming book with the title, I believe, When Are We?, spirituality of timekeeping. I should add that James also serves as editor-in-chief of Image Journal, a leading journal in the faith and arts field, whose strapline is art, mystery, and faith. And there's some free copies outside if you haven't seen those already. Dr. Smith will speak for about uh, 40, 45 minutes, after which will be time for some questions from the floor. Jamie, it is a delight to have you here. Uh, this is not your first visit here, of course, and we certainly hope it won't be the last. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Smith to speak on Embracing the Ephemeral, How Art Honors Creaturehood. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it's truly an honor. Uh, to be here and to be back at Duke and to be uh, um, invited by you, Jeremy, and Dan, thanks for all your help in, in making this happen. Thanks to all of you for being here. It's uh, honestly, it's a uh, humbling and it's a treat. Um, Jeremy mentioned I work with uh, Image, and please, please do grab a journal or get one for a friend. We, we really think of the Duke initiatives in theology and the arts as kind of one of our closest co-laborers in this field of theology and the arts. So it's fun to feel like a sense of resonance and partnership and, and to be building that in some ways uh, while, while I'm here this week. Um, uh, so this is, what, sorry, one more preface. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm giving you, back in my Pentecostal days, we would have called this new manna, which is, I'm bringing new material, and so I'm kind of field testing and treating you as guinea pigs a little bit. Uh, um, my publisher changed the title. I thought When Are We was very clever. Uh, they did not. So the new title is How to Inhabit Time. So this is coming from a book that will be out in September if um, uh, supply chains hold and the Suez isn't blocked, as they say. Um, and uh, uh, I'm really, really looking forward to our conversation about it afterwards, because listening to your feedback uh, is going to be very helpful to me. So let me try to paint a scene with words. We are driving through Pennsylvania's Susquehanna Valley. It's late October. The autumn sun is spread across the hills, and its illumination is tinged with its descent. The crisp air is a reminder that winter is coming. But today, this valley is on fire. We are surrounded by trees inflamed in reds and oranges. And as we ascend, the shades of goldenrod and pumpkin give way to umber and brown, as if the leaves are burnt and spent. We are witnessing the end. All this autumnal beauty is a halo around winter's death and dormancy. This, this sublime enchantment is a last act, a valedictory display only possible because actually these leaves are starving. 
They will not go gently into the night, but blaze against the dying of their light. And here I am in the midst of this, stunned and grateful for their spectacular demise. Their long green life was only a prelude to this fierce pageant that we are witnessing. The French poet Charles Baudelaire suggested that modernity was fascinated with what he called the ephemeral, the fugitive, the contingent. The ephemeral, the fugitive, the contingent. So rather than painting stolid landscapes, modernist painters attended to the ballerina's leap, the exhale of steam from the train, the golden light before the sun plunges again beneath the horizon. It's one of the reasons why Baudelaire was something of the patron saint for the Metropolitan Museum of Art's 150th anniversary exhibit that was called simply About Time. It was an exhibit that tried to look at the 150 years of the museum's history by focusing on fashion, which was fitting because fashion is that art that tacks to the winds of seasonal change, even if it also cycles through repetition and retrieval. So for example, pictured here is on the left, a 1902 riding jacket by Blossier, but it sits along a side, a 2018 garment from Louis Vuitton. You can see the echoes and the changes. Theologically then, modernism could be seen as an intense attunement to creaturehood and the liniments of the human condition. To be created is to be ephemeral, fugitive, contingent. To be a creature is to be a mortal, subject to the vicissitudes of time. The sun rises and bids farewell each day. The tulip pushes forth, blooms in glory, and then passes into hibernation. We learn, we remember, we forget. There is a sense in which learning to be a creature is a matter of learning to let go. So we need not only memento mori, but also, I'm making this up, memento tempori, reminders of our temporality, not just our mortality. The recognition, even embrace, of the ephemeral should be at the heart of what I want to call Christian temporal awareness. Imagine embracing the ephemeral as a discipline of not only conceding our mortality as a condition, but receiving our mortality as a gift. It's winter's loss, remember, that grants us fall's fire. So here's the theological nuance that we need to try to think through. Our finitude is not a fruit of the fall. Our finitude is not a fruit of the fall, even if it is affected by the fall. So contingency is not a curse. To live in resentment of that creaturely finitude is its own form of pride. Of course, of course. There is much to lament in many of our losses. We are robbed by the brokenness of the fall. But not everything that fades has been stolen. Not all passing away is an outworking of the curse. Learning to live with, even celebrate the transitory is, I want to suggest, a mark of what I'm calling Christian timekeeping, a way of settling into our creaturehood and resting in our mortality. To resent this is a mark of hubris. When we resent our own mortality, we resent that what's given us is not eternal. And then, all too often, I think what happens is we try to fabricate eternity. We cling and we dig in our claws and we refuse to let go. And the irony is that we we end up losing something in the grasping. Sometimes it's precisely when we try to seize and freeze what is passing, what is passing away that we actually abjure our creaturehood and in fact lose something while it's right in front of us. Th this, is, this is not a very um, 
uh, a highbrow example. But I, I still, <laughs> still remember this really, really jarring pairing of images when, uh, I'm going to get the years wrong, but let's say when Tiger Woods won his first Masters Championship in 2010. And there was a picture of the 18th green on which he plunged this putt to win the championship. And you see the crowd. It's like one of those sort of Renaissance paintings. And you see all these faces of the crowd. And everybody is surrounding him. And everybody is up on their toes. And eyes are wide open. And mouths are agape. And they are just watching. And you can see the beginning of the roar. And all of these faces and eyes are there. And then he won it again in 2019. And you see a similar picture of the gallery and the moment, and all you see are 14,000 of these, which is this screen between them and the moment, the triumph, the experience. And there's something, Sally Mann, a, a really remarkable photographer, talks about sometimes it's precisely our desire to grasp and freeze and try to capture the memory that actually makes us lose the richness of what we experienced. To be temporally aware of our creaturehood is, I want to say, to wear our mortality more comfortably. To live mortally, we might say, is to receive gifts by actually also learning to let go, finding joy in the fleeting present. This is temporal contentment. To inhabit time with eyes wide open, hands outstretched gratefully to receive, not to grasp, but to enjoy, and then let go. Uh, in every talk, I'm con contractually obligated to cite either the Avett brothers or Jason Isbell. So here's an a Jason Isbell lyric. Uh, Jason Isbell lyric in this, in this marvelous song, If We Were Vampires, here's a... a I'm not going to sing it to you. It's much better sung. But it goes like this. Great line. If we were vampires and death was a joke, we'd go outside on the sidewalk and smoke and laugh at all the lovers and their plans. I wouldn't feel the need to hold your hand. Maybe time running out is a gift. Sometimes knowing this won't last forever is what compels us to hold hands in the present. So Christian timekeeping, as I'm describing it, is like a, a dance on a tightrope. On the one hand, we're called to inhabit time in a way that stretches us to be aware of so much more than now. So, for example, as a traditioned people, mindful of our inheritances, we also then live futurally, looking for kingdom come. On the other hand, we always live in the present. So past gifts and future hopes coalesce in us in the present. I can't not be now. The challenge is to faithfully inhabit the present without caving into presentism in, in, in such matters, right? The trick is to live fully present to the moment without being defined by the zeitgeist. I say trick, but perhaps what I mean is a feat. In the spirit of Kierkegaard's Knight of Faith, who is such a ballet master, that they can make the stunning leap of faith in a way that seems effortless. He contrasts this, of course, with the Knights of Infinite Resignation, he says. They leap into eternity, but they can never figure out how to land in the world. They can't figure out how to stand and land in the world in which they find themselves. Kierkegaard puts it this way, every time they come down, they are unable to assume the posture immediately. They waver for a moment, and this wavering shows that they are aliens in the world. Friends, I think there are lots of religious people for whom their faith amounts to a leap into a nostalgic past or an escapist future, but the present completely bedevils them. Awkward and unsettled, they stumble and waver. They know how to be faithful anywhere but now. But, Kierkegaard says, to be able to come down in such a way that instantaneously one seems to stand to walk, to change the leap into life into walking, absolutely to express the sublime in the pedestrian, 
Only that night of faith can do it. And this is the one and only marvel. To know how to dance in divine time and walk like a human being, that's the marvel, the feat. The, the creation that is our home, the incubator of our now, is dynamic, right? So creation's being is becoming. I'm all of a sudden getting nervous that I'm wading into territory where people are going to be like, a foot's going to come down in the Q&A. But we'll see. That's why, that's why I'm here for. Accountability. Creation's being is becoming. So Eden is already roiling with change. Ephemerality is not something that befalls creation. It is a feature of finitude, I want to suggest. And aging is not a curse. Autumn is not a punishment. Not all that is fleeting should be counted loss. The coming to be and passing away that characterizes our mortal life are simply the rhythms of creaturehood. There is no way of being a creature that is not subject to the vicissitudes of time. And then here's one really outlandish, probably heretical claim. Even resurrected bodies change. If people are eating and drinking and feasting and digesting, there is a change, a process, a dynamism to even the new creation. So in his reflections on time in the Confessions, you knew St. Augustine was coming, St. Augustine says that, in a way, my very self is this nexus of past and future. In fact, he ventures that neither the future nor the past really exist, in a sense. He puts it this way, perhaps it would be exact to say there are three times, a present of things past, a present of things present, and a present of things to come. In the soul, there are these three aspects of time, and I do not see them anywhere else. So Augustine, quite audaciously, almost suggests that the present is all there is, almost is important, which is why ephemerality is sort of constitutive of creation. Augustine's examples often invoke the ubiquitous examples of speech and song as case studies for how being human requires use to getting used to this uh, uh, um, flow of loss and arrival, arrival and loss. Here's, here's one, indulge me, one long Augustine quote. It's from Confessions 11. Suppose I'm about to recite a psalm, which I know. Before I begin, my expectation is directed towards the whole. But when I have begun, the verses from it, which I take into the past, become the object of my memory. The life of this act of mine is stretched two ways, into my memory because of the words I've already said, and into my expectation because of those which I'm about to say. But my attention is on what is present. By that, the future is transferred to become the past. When I do something as simple as speak, human consciousness is this turbine of the present. It draws in a future to speak in the now with what has already been said in my wake. Every conversation is like this churn of anticipation and retention. And so Augustine says a person singing or listening to a song he knows well suffers a distension or stretching in feeling and in sense perception from the expectation of the future sounds and the memory of the past sounds. There's not joy in music without the fugitive nature of sound. There is no delight in the song without the gift of ephemeral notes that rise and linger and then fade to make way for more. And in the book, you will then see the reference to the esteemed Jeremy Begbie's entire corpus of work on theology, music, and time. But I would also say, don't miss, there's a fascinating discussion of um, the quartet for the end of time in resounding truth. So you might not immediately think that there's, there's time reflections in resounding truth, but it's also there too, so I'm, I'm indebted to Jeremy. To embrace the ephemeral is to live with such flux, to, to live gratefully amidst change, which is just to say it's to live as mortal. This, in fact, might be the teacher's deep lesson in Ecclesiastes. Not to bemoan our mortal estate, but to face it to accept it, 
and to find rhythms in sync with the fleeting nature of time. One might say that Ecclesiastes is an exercise in redeeming vanity. Now, I'm going to say right now, I'm just going to, first of all, let the record show Jamie Smith does talk about the Bible every once in a while. But as soon as he does, and he goes to the Old Testament, he's immediately worried about all the Old Testament scholars at Duke Divinity School who are going to hold him to account. So let me, let me try this out. So if you think of uh, the way to read Ecclesiastes as this exercise in redeeming vanity. So for example, the teacher says in Ecclesiastes 9.9, enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that are given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. So the sticky words here are vanity and toil, and they are rather sort of demoralizing, and don't they sit kind of uneasily with the teacher's opening injunction, which is enjoy, enjoy, vanity, toil. Enjoy meaninglessness? Enjoy emptiness? Enjoy vanity? The theologian Peter Lightheart explains our possible confusion here. The Hebrew word translated vanity, hebel, I think that's how you say it, is sometimes translated, absurdly, Lightheart says, meaninglessness. But he says, Hevel, vanity, means more literally mist, vapor. So when the word is used metaphorically, he says, it emphasizes the ephemerality and elusiveness of human existence. Human life is hebel because it's impermanent, because we change, because we ultimately die. So when the, when the teacher describes everything as hebel, he's not saying that everything is meaningless or pointless, He's highlighting the elusiveness of the world, which slips through our fingers and escapes all our efforts to manage it. Human life is hebel because we are mortals, and a human lifetime is like a mist that enchants us but then dissolves too quickly, a vapor that dissipates. So Lightheart notes that, in fact, hebel is the name of Adam's second son, the first human to suffer death, the first to know the reality of life's vaporousness. In the end, every last one of us is able. So the teacher is not consent, uh, 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 counseling us to resent that reality, but to face it. And so he doesn't despair that life is like, quote, as we often hear Ecclesiastes 1.14, chasing the wind. He says, rather, the Hebrew phrase should be translated shepherding the wind. Not chasing the wind, which seems pointless and meaningless, but shepherding the wind. This is not a counsel of despair or resignation, but rather an invitation to reframe expectations such that I can enjoy what's before me, who is with me, fleeting as their presence might be. The, the question isn't whether we can escape this condition, but how we will receive our mortality, how we will shepherd what's fleeting yet given. When my wife Diana, Diana, as she so often does, places on my desk a tiny vase of asters and zinnias. I'm learning flower names. Uh, uh, this, this is what, like my favorite thing that happens from May to September is I'll just be working at my desk and Deanna sneaks in and puts this lovely vase of flowers from her remarkable gardens. When she does that, should I resent the fact that they won't last forever? <laughs> that their scent will fade, that their petals will be litter in a few days? Should I mourn their impermanence? Or should I shepherd what I can't control by gratefully receiving them, nourishing them as long as I can, dwelling with their beauty in the now in which they're given? What if enjoying mortality means we stop chasing the wind and learn how to hoist a sail? The writer Robert Hudson attests that it was a quirky old poem called The Fly by William Oldest, I had never heard of it either, that taught him how to make friends with mortality. And I won't go into the poem, but I am intrigued by Hudson's own reflection on this. Here's what he says. The poem taught me an incomparable paradoxical lesson, which turns out to be a key to nearly all art at all times and in all places, that which weighs us down also lifts us up. 
It's the key to the Psalms and Dante's Divine Comedy and Shakespeare's sonnets and Mozart's Requiem and Van Gogh's paintings. It's the lesson that centuries of Japanese poets taught with their countless haiku about cherry blossoms. The Japanese term for it is mono no aware, a sense of beauty intensified by recognition of temporality. I have no doubt this is why God gave us art, to cope with the mystery of our mortality, to make sense of the fact that each life comes stamped with an expiration date. Or is mortality itself the gift because it adds such richness to life? This Japanese aesthetic principle, mano no aware, offers insight into a creaturely embrace of ephemerality. An awareness of transcendence does not have of transience doesn't have to translate into melancholy lament, though perhaps in a fallen, broken world, such melancholy and mourning is always just under the surface and will understandably break through. But an awareness of transience can deepen appreciation and gratitude. Indeed, for Yoshida Kenko, it is that things are fleeting that illumines their beauty. He says, if man were never to fade away like the dews of Adashino, never to vanish like the smoke over Toribiyama, how things would lose their power to move us. The intense beauty of the cherry blossoms is haloed by the short lives of each bloom. So what is required here is a specific kind of attention. Thus, Abu Tsunui, a Japanese nun from the 13th century, counseled poets to above all pay attention. She said this, they must know mano no aware, the awness of things, sensitivity and the ability to perceive things as they are and keep their mind clear. They must notice and keep their heart alert to the scattering of flowers, the falling of leaves, dew and showers, and when the leaves change color. That sensitivity to the awness of things, that, it seems to me, is the way to enjoy even what is transitory. And I think Hudson is right. It may be artists who help us best appreciate this fragile dynamism of creaturehood. This, this is, I think, no doubt because the arts specialize in ambiguity and nuance. <laughs> that is, what is art but the practiced discipline of evoking but not having to pin down? So a film a poem, a song, can really invite us into multiple states of mind, e evoking conflicting emotions, and yet we manage to hold them together so that we dwell in the world with an unspoken appreciation for its messiness and, its new, and a newfound humility in the face of complexity. Our, our mortality is fraught, and the arts are a bomb not because they heal us of our mortality, but because they absolve us of the need to control, to fix, to escape. Like the poetry of Ecclesiastes, they give us words and images that honor the entanglement we experience as creatures. I see this, for example, in the photography of the Kamoinga workshop, which was a remarkable collective of black photographers at work in New York City in the early 1970s. I was so fortunate, I was in Richmond, Virginia, right before um, the uh, plague. And uh, there was, a, so if you go, the Virginia Fine Arts Museum, or Virginia Museum of Fine Arts had this incredible show uh, of this, this collective, and there's a great catalog of it. And this was, this was such a, a remarkable experience because you saw photographers who are not trying to capture the ephemeral, they are trying to hallow it, I would say. So for example, this piece by Herbert Randall is simply called Untitled, Lower East Side, and it evokes a fading light, a way of inhabiting time, but without any pretension of having captured a moment. In fact, to the contrary, I think there's so much in this image that eludes us in its composition, in its soft depth focus. Randall's photograph, however, might attune me to my world differently. Are there ways in which my being ex experiencing and encountering this image are sort of training me to attend to what I might have missed, to just sit with it, to just be? Or consider, you might not have known Ming Smith was part of this, this collective. 
This is Ming Smith's marvelous and very justly fam famous image of Sun Ra, who was the prophet of Afrofuturism. How could photography ever do justice to musical performance? What photographer could hope to capture the ethereal longing of Sun Ra? And so Smith, I would say, doesn't try. Instead, she gives us an image that is as ethereal as its subject and that somehow attests to the swirling flux of time. I think this photo is best received as something like an icon. It's something that you see through, but there's also a sense in which we feel seen by it. It captures something of us. The reason why our mortality is fraught, why enjoyment and toil are companions, is because, of course, we experience so much loss that is tragic, loss that ought not to be. What we experience then now is not just mortality, but, uh, uh, and not just creaturehood, but it's post-lapsarian varieties, ruined by sin, a world that is not just temporal, but a temporality in which the fall has wreaked havoc. And so it, it becomes difficult, I, I understand, for us to sift tragedy from these good creaturely rhythms in which even good things phase, fade. Because mortality in this fallen world is so bound up with wrenching heartbreak, we can come to resent mortality itself. All decay seems like disaster. But I think to dwell faithfully mortally is to achieve a way of being in the world for which not all change is loss and not all loss is tragic, while at the same time naming and lamenting those losses that ought not to be. So like Kierkegaard's ballet dancer, I, I just did a little ballet move up here, you couldn't see it. Uh, um, we, we are back on this sort of veritable tightrope, as it were. To be faithfully mortal is a feat of receiving and letting go, celebrating and lamenting. Being mortal is the art of living with loss, knowing when to say thank you and knowing when to curse the darkness. I think Elizabeth Bishop's masterful and famous poem, One Art, is, a is like a meditation on just this precarious act. So let me, let's, let's, uh, I'll read through this and then I, I want to uh, uh, provide some exposition. I'm also terrible at reading poetry, but give, give, bear with me. The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day, accept the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster, places and names, and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch, and look, my last, or next to last, of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster, some realms I own, two rivers, a continent. I miss them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you. The joking voice, a gesture I love, I shan't have lied. It's evident the art of losing not too hard to master, though it may look like it. Write it like a disaster. Some things, the poet observes, almost seem intent on being lost, made for their demise, what Silicon Valley calls so grossly planned obsolescence. These things have an arc of existence, and, and we shouldn't be surprised by their twilight fade to black. Still, there's an art to losing. <laughs> One has to learn how to lose. It takes practice to see the signs of what's made to be temporary, to enjoy without clinging and clasping, so that when such things are gone, it's not a disaster. There is a lightness of touch to this poem. There's a kind of wit and humor. But to me, it feels a bit like someone trying to talk oneself into this posture. The grin and chuckle feel like nervous ways to fake it till we make it. And so the losses accumulate in the poem, which is to say, 
we have lots of opportunity to practice this art. We can imagine learning to lose car keys and such. We tell ourselves losing a watch shouldn't matter, except that it's mother's watch. And it's easy for us to imagine an aura around it that is about so much more than a timepiece. Not a disaster, but not easy either. The losses keep mounting, which is just to say the poet continues living. living. There's a deepening ache to later losses. Even if they too should be expected, there will always be a last visit to a beloved city or hometown, a last foray to the contemplative sanctum of Montana's wilderness, a final adventure in Europe, the last time you'll walk over the Pont de Notre Dame and be quietly mesmerized by the cathedral that bears the scars of its own combustibility. And then the loss we're dreading. The loss we know is coming. You. Every one of us imagines someone in that line. There is an art even to losing you. And the poet doesn't want to lie. It should be possible. But here is the written testament, a protest bearing on refusal that this certainly looks like a disaster. A young Augustine experienced this sort of disaster, an experience of loss where we lose our stars and the entire cosmos dims to a jaded meaninglessness. This is book four of the confession, which I know you already all knew. But looking back, the older Augustine would say that his younger self hadn't yet learned the art of losing and hadn't yet imagined how loss is framed by resurrection. Happy is the person who loves you, Augustine prays, and his friend in you, and his enemy because of you. Though left alone, he loses none dear to him, for all are dear in the one who cannot be lost. The art of losing is not easy, friends. For mortals, it amounts to an acrobatic feat, but we practice above the net of the God who is all in all. In one of the earliest works called Of True Religion, Augustine begins to address what will be an enduring theme across his corpus for the rest of his life. And the theme is simply this, how to love, how to love. Space, he says, offers us something to love, but time steals away what we love and leaves in the soul crowds of phantasms which incite desire for this or that. And so the mind becomes restless and unhappy, vainly trying to hold that by which it is held captive. It's summoned to stillness, so that it may not love the things which cannot be loved without toil. So the trick, Augustine says, is to learn how to love what you'll lose. That doesn't mean despising what can't endure or hating what is transitory. It means holding it with an open hand, loving it in ways appropriate to mortal things, because when love is rightly ordered, we can embrace even the ephemeral. Thanks very much. Jimmy, thank you so much. Um, not only massively stimulating, but beautifully crafted as well. Thank we you. We appreciate that. Thanks thank so you much. very much. We have time now, plenty of time actually, for some questions, uh, for some reactions. Is there somebody, may I ask a, b a big question while yeah. we're, great. Just while to they're getting up, up their courage. And then, and then Norman. Um, yes, it's just obviously that, that current in the biblical literature where death seems to be a punishment right. for sin. Right. Right. And how that goes. I, I think I know what you'll say, but could you just yeah. clarify? Your yeah, mind well, and I would, I would love to hear, this is, this is where I'm like, I pull out this card, which is, I'm not a theologian. I'm a yeah, philosopher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, that's my get out of jail free card. So l let me think out loud with you, because I would actually love Good. to hear. Good. So um, two things. The first is, I do think taking... Uh, evolutionary history seriously has already posed this question for Christian theology in ways that people have thought more creatively about this than we maybe had in the past. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a sense in which um, uh, I do think uh, taking seriously the, what we know of sort of uh, uh, 
evolutionary history has meant that we had to start theologically entertaining why a kind of death mm -hmm. uh, um, could be imagined as part of a good creation, right? And so then, this is, and this is where I think some, of, some ancient theologians are maybe entertaining this, but I would, honestly, it would be helpful for me to hear the bad news in this regard. Uh, um, it seems to me that there are, have been some proposals across theological history that imagined the end of Adam bef without a fall could still have been something like a kind of autumnal fade which then would have real, been realized in a kind of resurrection. And what, what, what comes with the death that arrives with the fall is, of course, precisely the, the, uh, um, the robbing of it, the, the tragedy of it, the, the, the uh, um, pain and, and uh, uh, um, uh, invasiveness of the way we experience death and disease and, and, and pain. But that there could have been a way of imagining uh, a lifetime coming to fade to a natural, having an arc to it that ends and then a resurrection that mm -hmm. also feels natural. Am mm -hmm. I, am I just making this start. up? That's a great start, that's a great start. Um, is it on, the, on that, Norman? No, it's on something, but I expect we'll come back to that in the question time. Norman, far away. So first of all, Jamie, this was really great. Thank Lots you. that you're doing here that I like. I want you to think a little bit more about the role of technological interface because Sorry, say that again. The technological interface that we all live through right now. So, for instance, you mentioned the mist of Ecclesiastes. Today, it's the cloud. <laughs> and what this means is really, really important for temporality because the cloud makes time no longer linear because everything, nothing is fleeting because it's all kept in the cloud, right? So, there is no longer a past. And this is important because the conception mm. of time that you, 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 when you give the examples, they're biological, right? Yes. It's seasons, yes. it's bodies. Very much. But we are becoming more and more divorced from any biological understanding of the world yeah. and of our own bodies. Yeah. So I'm wondering, how do you understand the kind of technological interface that has seriously affected the way we think about temporality and whether or not something like Christian docetism has a role to play Christian docetism, right? As part of the embrace by many Christians of this technological world that yes. we love. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, this is, this is very suggestive. So uh, thinking with you, um, so on the, it, it yeah, w would you say in some ways so much the propulsion of a kind of technique and technological frame for our being in the world is to deny our temporality precisely because it only upholds a um, incessant present. Uh, and, and there would be still a kind of fleetingness to that, wouldn't it? And that's different than what I mean by ephemeral. Right. Right, right. So, so and, and yet, there's not any sense of, like, the cloud doesn't have rings like the tree, right? So there's not a story to be told about that. I, I think that's really suggestive. Mm. Uh, in the book, I talk about forms of what I call no-when Christianities, and I think that's your docetic point, right? I think that it's shocking the way that we can have forms of Christianity, because of docetic tendencies now, I would say, that imagine they sort of float above any kind of indebtedness, um, any sort of, uh, of historical embeddedness, which then also might explain why so often Christians are susceptible to being like so easily hoodwinked by this kind of technological and, right, and, and uh, the, the great God of relevance uh, sort of governing everything in the way we do it. That's really helpful. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Great. Jamie, I, I, I wanted to give you the opportunity to uh, say something about the polemical implication of what you've done. Political? No, polemical. 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 I mean, when do you get a chance to say that 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 piece of art is just shit? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yes. So, right. I, I would say, I would say, it would be interesting to think through, actually, Jonathan Anderson would be a really interesting person to have this conversation with. In some ways, what, what we could do is come up with aesthetic criteria that are also informed by this sensibility, both this theological sensibility and this temporal sensibility. And in that case, one of the ways that we would judge works of art is in, in, by the extent to which they are trying to sort of like cling to or, or uh, rise above uh, our, our historical embeddedness, or are also, you could also say this is a way to describe idolatrous pretensions in some art, which are, to, they are making themselves only to be monumental, right? And to them, themselves become works of art that sort of freeze our attention and uh, uh, um, defy uh, ephemerality. Um, uh, Sorry, I'm having a little trouble hearing, sir. I'm thinking about the difference of the Tate in London to the Museum of Modern Art. I like the Tate a lot. The Museum of Conceptual Art doesn't move me. Oh, oh, yeah, so, so, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess this is actually one of the reasons why um, I think this creates a new theologically attuned way or frame for Christians to maybe come to an, a, a surprising appreciation of conceptual art, installation art, the kinds of things that you might run into MoMA. So you, you want to go back and look, I'm, I'm not going to say the pre-Raphaelites or something, but I, I, there's a certain, I, I do think that some Christian aesthetic sensibilities don't really have a place to value uh, conceptual installation art, for example. And what, one of the things I want to say is, I actually see that work as living into the ephemeral, the fugitive, the contingent. And to me, that is something about creaturehood that's going on there. So that in, insofar, now that doesn't mean that there isn't, aren't bad forms of that and, you know, un unhelpful forms of it. But there, the, the, the form itself of contemporary installation or conceptual art, um, I love it that it that it doesn't last forever. I, I think you folks have talked to about like Andy Goldsworthy's work. So so sculptors who create a sculpture that can't possibly survive the next season uh, of the elements. To me, that is that is a actually a very powerful theological commentary that, that uh, makes the art, I won't say beautiful, but effective, uh, uh, moving in that way. I don't know, I might not be tracking with you, but I, we'll see. Thank you, Sonny. Yes. Thank you. Over here, have we got a mic? I am so interested in uh, the way that you took, I think, a, to me, a profoundly counterintuitive approach to the role of art as ephemeral, because so much art is an attempt to create a monument, uh, you know, to, uh, to preserve something, to produce continuity, to influence the future or um, maintain memory. Um, and I'm, you know, I kept thinking, you know, not, not, not gar marble nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this yeah. powerful rhyme. Um, and I wonder if you could speak to the tension. Do you see these as like maybe two different kinds of art? Yeah. The idolatrous art that tempts the free to freeze the moment or, uh, versus uh, an art that appreciates ephemerality? Or is there a more complex interaction? This is a very helpful question. Thank you. So I'm thinking of it this way, and tell me if this helps. Um, I, because um, I might have got my argument flipped, I don't want to say that the only art that's worth valuing is ephemeral. What I do want to say is that I do think the arts are uniquely primed to help us become a people who learn how to be mortal and live with and receive gratefully the ephemeral. So, so I, yeah, I, I don't want to write off all kinds of art that has other goals and objectives and life. Do you know what I mean? Like, for example, it is, there is something um, 
I don't think it's a performative contradiction, right? But the fact that I'm invoking photographs from the early 1970s means, oh, these things have hung around. Do you know what I mean? Like these, these have a life. These aren't just snapshots. These aren't just like pictures on my iPhone that I'll never look at again. They've actually created an endurance. But then what interests me is, are they enduring for us because actually in the composition of the work, they speak to ephemerality and contingency and mortality in ways that I don't think a theological treatise could or something like that. So th it's, it's more, here's why I think the arts are uniquely poised to help us receive the gift of mortality and ephemerality, even though there are also other, all kinds of other good things and good modes of art that could be doing that. Does that, does that seem like a fair distinction? Yeah. The, the, I, Cause I, I'm, I don't even want to just write off the intention to create a monument. Um, uh, definitely not, definitely not. Um, but, but I think then we could also think about monumental desires in the arts that are themselves idolatrous. <laughs> so there's, there's so much parsing that has to happen. Yeah, thank you for that question. Janet, you have a sim? Thank you for a brilliant lecture. I've already learned so much. Thank uh, you. Really fascinating. The book sounds wonderful. And, and what you just said about conceptual art made me um, jolt a bit because I was thinking, and I may have this wrong, but there was a, in an English cathedral, there was a Bill Viola installation. Is that right? Yeah. And it was a, a video shown mm. through, and you know, people are scandalized. But speaking about what you are, about ephemerality, isn't this just what should be shown? I'm, I'm not saying it should all the time be shown. Yeah. But it struck me that really when you, um, a lot of as it were, you might say, traditional Christian art captures the ephemeral. If you're going persistently to a church like Duke Chapel with those grise windows, every time you go in, it's different. It's the same, but it's different. Uh, the music is the same, but it's different. The, this, this, this repetition, and I think one way Christianity in some of its, uh, some of its variations captures this ephemerality is actually the liturgical year. Mm -hmm. So do you think there is a way um, that we should be really more conscious of this ephemerality in, that, that does inhabit, you might say, historic practices as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. So an another, uh, this is a lame answer because I'm saying, go read the book. But uh, So uh, another chapter of the book is on seasonality as a feature of our mortality, which goes back to your biological and, and in there, I highlight precisely why the disciplines and practices of the liturgical calendar are, I would say, a very uniquely countercultural training in this odd way of inhabiting time, which is actually to embrace cycle, and yet at the same time to realize every time I relive that cycle, I'm, I'm hearing this differently. I'm seeing it differently. You know, we all know, like, every, every Eastertide, some other aspect of this incredible uh, uh, cosmic redemption sort of hits a different side of your heart and soul and you sort of live into a new way. Or, or the years it's just flat for you. There, there's something I think so unique in a sensibility about that. So you're right. I think um, in a way we can be spiritually disciplined to be attuned to this dynamic of flux and time and flow that we then even bring to our monuments. We even bring to those things that don't change around us, and yet you hear them differently, you see them differently, you experience them differently, and that too is beautiful. Like what a, what a richness to keep adventuring in life uh, in, in that way. There's, there's a great line, um, I'm gonna garble it now. Um, uh, Gustavo Gutierrez in Theology of Liberation says, uh, history is God's temple. History is God's temple. And I love it that it's not a spatial claim. It's this dynamic claim about, about time. And I think living into that is part of it. It's great. Thank you very Excellent. much. Excellent. Uh, yes. Just one, one second. Just get the microphone to you. That's fine. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for the lecture. Uh, I was curious... It seems like a lot of the conversation around um, ephemerality is almost focused in the existential or subjective lens. Okay. Kind of playing off the last question, how are we best to understand these 
um, artistic or liturgical expressions that we perform corporately with an understanding that our corporate expression is not temporal or ephemeral. Um, whereas we individually might be the, for lack of a better word, the church yeah. um, is not necessarily an ephemeral temporal reality understood theologically. Yeah. Because the gates of hell shall not prevail against it? Is that what you, you mean? Or uh, just in light Which of, I believe, by the way, I just want to clarify. Yeah. But I, I just want to understand the question. Well, Right. I, yeah, I might be. I might be off on this. No, 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 thinking, no. Thinking more on the lines of understanding the identity as the church, the the being called and claimed by God as a non as a non temporal only title, as a not fleeting identity. And when yeah. we engage in these symbolic, sacramental, artistic, um, ephemeral practices, we are appealing to this supposedly non temporal identity. And so how do we understand? Yeah, so we might, we might just disagree on how to formulate this because uh, um, there, I still just have this little tick in my gut that, that I have a reservation about imagining the church as a non-temporal community. I, I think there's a, other ways for us to describe what you're talking about, which is it is not a... Um, uh, there is, of course, an eternity that characterizes uh, uh, this. There is an eternality. There is an, but I would frame it in terms of an ongoingness of God's covenant faithfulness to a community. And the reason why that makes a difference is because you're actually, uh, um, it's not stasis. It's, it, there's a dynamism, but the dynamism is the faithful acts of the triune God and the body in communion with that God. So there's, there's, uh, um, and that shall never fail. Do you know what I mean? Like that, 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 that's exactly the grounds of a hope that is eternal, but it's the hope of an ongoing dynamic relationship in that way. Um, uh, the other reason why I just, I, I think it's helpful to, to talk about the, the sort of enduringness of God's faithfulness to the body of Christ in that way is that it also means we don't fall into the trap of imagining that the church is somehow immune to history. Which, for which we have ample evidence that that is not the case. Do you know what I mean? And, and I think sometimes these forms of what I call no end Christianities, uh, um, uh, you know, instead of a view from nowhere, they think they are in a place of no when. That's exactly when they imagine they are above it all and, and are also least likely to see their own capitulations to the zeitgeist or whatever it might be. Yeah, you're, you're asking an important question. Great. Gentleman in the front room. Yes, um, thank you so much for the lecture, as everyone else has said. And I'm still pro kind of processing and trying to put this question yeah. together, and the last comment kind of distracted me a little bit, so, which is okay, it was good. But the sense of mortality, like I hate death. Yeah, yes. And I also yeah. think... Yeah. <laughs> Wait a few years, brother. It's, it gets worse. Yes. <laughs> 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 But I also think you have a good point in that we are creatures, we're bound temporally, and mortality is a gift. Yeah. I'm thankful I don't have to live in this sinful world forever. Yes, yes, yeah. But at the same time, this idea of creaturehood or temporality, somehow, I think, as Christians, we participate with the divine life. Yep. Uh, Trinitarian, like, relationship at the core of our reality that is eternal. And I, uh, not just ongoing, but eternal, I don't think the laws of time affect God in the same way. And so how does our creaturehood, combined with this eternal mystery, kind of, how does that play together? And, and how, what, what do we do with that when we should say, okay, someone I love dies. Yeah. That ought not to be. Right. But your claim that, well, we also die, even in Eden. <laughs> but... Uh, like, I also agree with you that, you know, be grateful of the time you had. And I think that's really, really helpful. But also, you know, uh, the wages of sin is death. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I'm just so, No, no, no. I'm, I, I, and, and it's, it, it, I, I, for me, that it's, it's the hardest feat to pull off. And, and which might mean it's just impossible, but you're kind of, working on it at least, which is how do you sift out um, 
the lament of the tragic from the proper reception of the contingent, right? And and um, contingency, ephemerality, you know, coming to be and passing away are part of the rhythms, it seems to me, of a good creation even. But at this point, that is really just a speculative reality because the only world we know is the fallen world in which we live. However, it is also the world in which the resurrection has already happened, yeah. right? So you're, you're always living in the shadow of both the, you know, uh, the fall, but also in light of the light of the resurrection. And so you're always, uh, um, you are both receiving and mourning in light of both of those realities, it seems to me. And, and I, uh, yeah, like I'm, trust, I, I, I'm in my 50s now and mortality really sort of starts to rear its head. And, uh, and yet on the other hand, you can sort of, I, I guess, well, no, I don't want to talk flippantly about this because I just don't know. Uh, uh, you know, obviously, I, you imagine, an, you know, I've been married for 32 years, can't imagine a world in which I am not with Deanna. Uh, and, but then you start imagining, well, what will be the different ways in which our story could come to an end? And I can uh, totally imagine horrible, tragic ways. Um, but I, I guess I'm coming to a place where I can also imagine what a peaceable a uh, grateful way would be, and it's, but I don't get to choose. <laughs> you know, so it's about how to sort of prepare yourself. Brett, yeah. do you, have we got a microphone for Brett? Our poet in residence. Great. Thanks so much for this. Um, first, I really appreciate how it seems like you're trying to expand whatever it is we think of when we think about mortality, wanting to say, Mortality means something more than just being a creature that will inevitably die. Yeah, right. Great. I'm glad that came through. That's definitely part of it. It is for, to, for me. I'll, I'll, I'm going to let you finish, as Kanye said. <laughs> but um, uh, it is, that is exactly what I'm trying to get is... For us, for me, it's a little unfortunate that the lexical range of the word mortal for us is immediately and, and largely tied on the terminus rather than a way of being in time. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, I think that was really helpful for me. It still doesn't get around the question of the terminus. Yeah. And in a way, the question I want to pose to you has to do with the sort of terminus of, of death, not in the same way as the first question we started talking about. I'd like to think about advertising. Which okay. Is to say, Dr. Wurzba raised this question about planned obsolescence that I think is really relevant here. To expand the sort of register we have to work with, I'm also thinking about how the literal architects of the Third Reich were really invested in making buildings that would become beautiful ruins. And I wonder which resources you find as you've been doing this work, I wonder which resources you might offer to think through attempts at using temporality, using ephemerality as a tool of manipulation whether in the service of the market, designing and putting mm. out products that will fail in such a way that people must buy more, or as an ideological tool a la monuments. Yeah. I, I, I would probably go exactly where you have, which is the market. And I do the, uh, this a bit in Desiring the Kingdom, where I think one of the things that, that gets skewed in the sort of gospel of consumerism is precisely a temporality um, that actually still comes with its own version of sin, like this kind of skewed version of sin and mortality. But but it, the solution is not resurrection; it's consumption and right new acquisition. And the novelty sets up novelty. I'm trying to think if there are other, if there are other, um, there has to be a political correlate to this. And in some ways, so this is totally off the top of my head, so I'm just making this up as I go. But I would say it, one of the things that, that currently um, befuddles and mars our republic is that we don't actually govern anymore. We just incessantly campaign, right? So we don't get government. We just get incessant campaigning. And if that is the time, if that's the way you inhabit political time, now what you are doing, say, as... Uh, uh, representative in, in Congress is your 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 inhabiting time with a view to fundraising rather than a view to actually exercising appropriate authority and stewardship and so on and so forth. So, the election cycle, 
now becomes a veritable liturgical calendar, and we all become people who are just following horse races of you know who's leading in the polls and who's going to win, and, and we're all basically sort of, uh, um, everything is a, is a spectator event. And it seems to me like that, that completely guts any sense of the common wheel and common wealth that we are engaged in together. Um, and I, I guess I haven't thought through before until your question how much that itself is depending on the ephemerality of the term or whatever. It might, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah. It's a really good question. It's very suggestive. I'm gonna Just to going. say, uh, people are leaving not because you've entered a swamp of heresy, <laughs> but uh, because there are classes to I, go I, to. I, but I'll take one more question. If we can, if that's from Jonathan. It's great. Jamie, thank you so much for the uh, fantastic talk. And uh, thanks for your comments about conceptual art. I think you're right about that. Great. Um, this is a somewhat unformulated question, but uh, you have me thinking about apophatic theology oh. here. Oh. Um, uh, Baudelaire, his line about the ephemeral and the contingent, he says, the other side of which is the eternal, uh, in the same sentence. Um, and I, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, like, one of the kind of ways that apophatic theology often functions, I think in a reduced form, is through negation. Yeah. This is the yeah. ephemeral, and we just procedurally negate the ephemeral and the contingent, as a means of thinking the uh, unrepresentable, yeah. timeless, and so yes. on. Um, but I'm wondering if, if there's actually a way of um, working apophatic theology here that proceeds by way of affirming the... Uh, I see what you're doing. Go, fit, spin this that, out. That is an right. embrace rather than a withdrawal or a negation or some, something like that. Uh, I'll let you run with that. No, 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 no. no I, I, I didn't mean to short circuit. So keep the mic, keep the mic for a second. So um, let me see if I understand the analogy. I, I hear it as sort of an anal analogical suggestion. And I, I'm with you that um, the sort of like pop invocation of apophatic traditions um, often seem to forget that lots of articulations of those apophatic theologies were, were um, emerging from people in communities that inhabited the divine office and lived an entire like anchoring centered mode of, of affirmation and participation and so on. And that the, that the apophatic was an exercise that only made sense even because of that sort of centering and anchoring in a community. And so in the same way, I, it strikes me, if this is your suggestion, this is right. There's a way in which I'm like arguing for this, you know, embrace of the ephemeral, but I would only ever do that because it's rooted and anchored in the eternal or, or, or in the, the incarnational reality of uh, the intersection of the transcendent God in time and that we are now in part of a community that participates in that reality. So it's almost like I have kind of the theological security to lean out so, into the fem ephemeral. Whereas if you take that away, this could sound like, like it's almost like a, a recipe for embracing the ephemeral could fall into the wrong hands. And then all you get is, uh, maybe, and maybe that relates to Norman's first question, all you get is just incessant chasing of the next experience, rather than the grateful receiving. Maybe reception is the key. Am, am, I, am I thinking with you? Yeah, okay, that's, that's helpful. That's Thank really good. Thank you very much indeed. That's great. You mentioned Deanna once or twice. I didn't see you, Deanna, when I first got up, so my apologies, and welcome to Duke. It's lovely to have you here. That's great. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy your time here, obviously. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna call on Alberto now, Alberto La Rosa Rose, to give a... Um, why don't we give uh, Dr. Smith another round of applause for a wonderful conversation. Thank you all for being here for our distinguished lecture of the Duke Initiatives in Theology and the Arts of 2022. Um, my name is Alberto La Rosa Rojas, as Dr. Bebby said. Thank you, Dr. Bebby, for facilitating the conversation. Uh, not only thank you to those here, but thank you to those online who uh, gathered here with us virtually. Um, and uh, thank you, Dr. Smith, again, for 
inviting us to consider the lilies, to uh, embrace our mortality and to learn how to lose. So thank you all for being here. Blessings on your day and go in peace.